In Lake Washington, just east of Seattle, sits a five mile long island left behind by a melting glacier some 10,000 years ago. It was scarred by deep ravines and soon covered with a thick forest. Indians dropped by to collect berries and hunt, but did not stay. Only a few traces of the past remain in today's prosperous suburb. But not long ago, within living memory, this island was a remote, bucolic, magical place. Judge Thomas Mercer named Lake Washington at a 4th of July picnic in 1854, and his guests, in turn, named the island in the middle after him. But it would be 30 years before Mercer Island would see permanent residence. Vitus Schmid staked his first claim in the center of the island in 1876 and brought his family to settle there in 1889. Charles and Agnes Olds selected 123 acres on the eastern shore of the island in 1884. And they proved up the claim and, and they moved on to Mercer Island in 1885. They had a son, David, and a daughter, Alla. That's my grandmother, Alla Olds Luckenville, and uh, where she was born, Alla Olds. She finished the equivalent of high school, and she went one year to the Territorial University in Seattle. And she got a teacher certificate and taught for a year in Kennedale. Charles planted 12 acres of old-fashioned russet, golden, and pippin apples, along with cherry, quince, and green gauge plums. He dubbed his spread Appleton. This was in the 1890s, and 80s and 90s. His idea was to plant a lot of uh, different apples and grow them for sale at the markets. In 1888, an ambitious young man named C.C. Calkins planned an extravagant resort on the island served by his own steamer. The magnificent Calkins Hotel hosted President Benjamin Harrison in 1891. But it was not to last. The Depression of 1893 coupled with a string of personal tragedies, finished Calkins' dream. After sitting empty, the hotel was converted to a sanitarium, which soon closed. It was a boarding house and summer hotel when a fire burned it to the ground in 1908. Left in Calkins' wake was a small but growing community, including many children. These are their stories of how Mercer Island was and how it came to be. Well, they came in, in 1908. Uh, I had been born in Iowa in 1906. Ray Ogden uh, already had a house on Mercer Island. And our first uh, night in Washington was spent in what he called his tower. He liked Mercer Island, and uh, it looked like a good place to my father and mother. So they decided to, uh, to buy a lot. When my father first built a house up there, uh, there were no uh, facilities like electrical sewer or anything like that. And so we had to rely on an acetylene power plant. Our parents were acquainted with the Clarks, <clears throat> and the Clarks had been here. They moved here in the early 1900s. And then my father became interested in a real estate project in Bend, Oregon. The Depression hit, and he lost everything, and everything except the property here. My father came home one night and said, we're going to live on an island. So we drove down, and he pointed out all these tufts of grass where the geese were living in the water. He said, that's an island and sounded fine to him, and I was terrified. And he couldn't understand why I was so upset the more he talked about our moving to an island. <laughs> and finally, uh, I just burst into tears and said, there's not room for our family on one of those islands. <laughs> and he realized that I wasn't the top of my class. Mom and Dad went around the island in a 
their canoe and picked out this lot. And uh, before they were married, uh, 1916 was the year they were married. If we thought that we uh, just died and gone to heaven because we slept in a tent and cooked over an open fire. My father came to what was then called the Boys Parental School, I think in 1905. And my mother was uh, had just gotten out of normal school in Wisconsin. She and her cousin had come west. In Mom's diary, she says the wedding was, was lovely, and then Captain Hyde took them down to the boat, and they caught the 1125 boat to Mercer Island, and they lived in those two tents for four months, she said, while they were building their house. My father was not a carpenter, and I know that they hired some sort of a local builder to put it in. Uh, one story my dad tells is how they uh, put the lumber off at the wrong dock, and he had to get up at five o'clock every morning and go down with his canoe, it must have been, and haul some of the timbers back in, in the lake and then carry them back up the hill. At that time, it was not considered safe to drink water out of Lake Washington uh, unless it was uh, chlorinated. So they had a, an 80-foot well dug by hand digging, uh, but it never turned out very well. Actually, I have a, a baby book that is signed by uh, my, at my first base birthday party, and it's signed by George Clark and Ted Clark and Harold Higday and Raymond Ogden, and all these fellows must have been teenagers at the time. I decided they'd probably never seen a baby before. Mother eventually quit teaching school, and, and my brother and I were, I was born actually on the school grounds, and um, my mother made it to town for my brother's birth, so that, you know, but that wasn't uncommon at all. Children were born at home, that was a standard thing. I remember my first grade teacher scared me to death. She had a, a dress that had beads on it all the way around the hem and all the way down the front, and she rattled when she, I, I can, I can remember she just, yeah, I was so, uh, upset one day that I, I said I, I just had to go home and they let me go home, walk a whole mile home by myself, first grader. It was incredible, really. Ruth Mary, I could identify Ruth Mary. She looks more like she did as a little girl than, than uh, anybody I know. It's amazing. The second year we had this incredible teacher that I'd had for three years and I just adored her. And there were two teachers that year. One was Miss Richards and one was Miss Richards' son. And uh, they thought they'd get mixed up, so they called Miss Richards and Miss Barbara. Four grades in a school. And, and I always, as I grew up, began to think how, what a challenge it was to teachers, because I always sent a teacher fresh out of what was then called normal school. And here we were, we practically came out of the woods like the kids in the backwoods of Georgia. My brother and I had a pony. We rode to school occasionally. And it was a single portable with uh, one, two, three, four grades lined up. Is that not a challenge to a teacher fresh out of school? My mother uh, taught me until uh, I was uh, old enough to walk down uh, and uh, I, think, I think I entered either the third or fourth grade. But uh, it was, I was only there for about uh, not more than a couple of years when they built the first East Seattle school. And that school had four rooms with two classes in each room. We used to walk to East Seattle school uh, all through There's grade a, school. And, and about a mile. And, but there were, there were planks because there were very wet spots. Mm. Slippery. When I went into the fifth grade, uh, I could listen to what they were teaching in the sixth grade. So when it came my turn to be in the sixth grade, uh, I was somewhat of a nuisance because I already knew what they were trying to teach me. So my teacher promoted me up to the seventh grade. We had the regular graduation ceremony 
from the eighth grade. And when I graduated from the eighth grade, there were nine in my class. And well, I was a little younger, and I had 14 in my class. <laughs> oh, jeez. I was 10 years old, 10 years old when we moved here. And this was a very long ways south. All, most of my friends, there were two other kids my age that lived in the area, but almost everybody lived up by the uh, East Seattle School, what is now the Boys and Girls Club, and that's where I started the school. If I'd been here one year earlier, I would have gone to the Sunnybeam School, which was a one-room school with a teacher, and they had 11, I think 11 students or 20 students. That was the public school that yeah. was at the south end. The East Seattle School was the public school at the north end. Those were the only two schools, really, for a long time on the island. I then went to Garfield High School, and uh, the, the, that was for, traumatic, totally traumatic for for somebody who had, uh, you know, there were thousands, of, I don't know how many thousand kids that were at Garfield High School. But I look back on it now as one of the great experiences of my life because it was uh, so multiracial. I graduated from Franklin High School in 1922. So we could go to Franklin High School, Garfield High School, or Bellevue High School. And because my older sister had gone to Franklin for two years, and hadn't done very well. Uh, my dad, dis and there was a toll on the bridge, and it was kind of complicated, the transportation. Uh, my dad decided that we would both get changed and go over to uh, Bellevue High School. Teenage delinquent boys and girls is about as much trouble as you want to get into, I would think. And dad said, unless they separate the boys from the girls, and put the girls in another school. I won't, you know, I just can't consider it. Dad's idea was to turn it into a self-supporting school. They had a prize-winning herd of Holstein cattle. They had pigs. I love to tell Mercer Island people that we had pigs on 300 feet of gently sloping Mercer Island waterfront. A farm supervisor, Jim Johnson, was there for, I think, even longer than Dad ran the farm end of it, and um, they had a smokehouse, hams, bacon. We had berries of all kinds. We had grapes. There were orchards up above, corn, beans, you know, all the, all the vegetables that would grow were grown there. And it was really largely fed by the kids themselves. That connection with the realities of life and the Pleasant associations with farm life had a, an effect of, of making the kids think a little differently about their lives because most of them were first or second offenders from the city, from, from badly broken homes. There were lots of them then too, God knows. The parental school was on the island a long time and they used to play, uh, their uh, band used to play at, at functions. Dad made the purchase for the Seattle School District I think it was 1912 and 1915, the two pieces. And the total that he always quoted was $15,000 for the entire 1,600 gently sloping front feet of Mercer Island waterfront. Then this was orchard apples in this area. This is, of course, before that building was built, which was, I think, completed in 28. We're headed down to toward the administration building where our family lived. And uh, Dad planted those poplars. This led straight up to it, to administration. And then that had the central kitchen in it and uh, all the food was distributed from that for all meals. The kids came and had big heated wagons to take around to the various buildings. There were two swimming holes and the kids all had to learn to swim. Many of them, as you can imagine, didn't hadn't even been in a lake. And this central heating plant was, was uh, the latest. And it was part of that splurge that, that allowed that rather handsome looking brick building to be built. When boys' parental home got to be that kind of a, a stigma in which parents threatened their children with incarceration there if they didn't shape up, they thought maybe they ought to change it because it, it isn't and wasn't that kind of a school. And uh, 
then because Luther Burbank was such a famous uh, horticulturist and part of the kids' duties here involved that kind of thing, it seemed especially appropriate. So I, I felt it was absolutely right. I think, as I recall, the school district and my father kind of came together on that name. But then, of course, it took about two years for Luther Burbank to have the same stigma attached to his name, and, and lots of people even today don't, I have to say, don't know who the real Luther Burbank was. There was about a 15-bed hospital here, and a full-time nurse, Ida Brown was her name, and uh, when the kids came here on arrival, they got their head shaved and, you know, like the old days of getting in the army. And Ida Brown, who ate at our lunch table in the, in the administration building every day, was a very firm lady and uh, handled her job very well. Everybody was scared to death of her, including me. We'd have Sunday gatherings, Sunday afternoon, and Jim Johnson, the farmer, would, would bring the corn and the chickens, and we'd have fried chicken and big kettles of roasting corn, and we had picnic tables over there, and anybody could swim that wanted to. If a kid would run away, Dad had, in the early days, knew everybody's telephone number on Mercer Island, anybody who had a boat, and he'd call everybody and say, lock up your boat, there's a kid loose, and then they'd go on a hunt, and almost inevitably find the boy. My father was a circus fan, and he took us kids to the circus He'd always take us ahead of time when they were putting it up so we could see the elephants pull the tents up and so that kind of thing. And he loved the sideshow. So I wasn't with him at this time. And one time, later years, he went to a sideshow. And there was a wild man from Borneo there who was eating raw meat. And uh, Dad naturally went to see that. And the wild man from Borneo looked up and looked at Dad, and Dad looked at him and he had been a boy at the school. And uh, they recognized each other instantly and the, the wild man from Borneo gave him a sign and when he was through with his act, they got, they got together and reminisced about the old days at Luther Burbank. So my father uh, bought a lot uh, on the, it was on the top of an 80 foot bluff uh, because the uh, the lake had not yet been lowered and the water would come up right to the foot of the bluff. <laughs> of course, when they lowered the lake, that made quite a difference. When all of this beach area was first exposed, it was quite interesting in that uh, there was, oh, like clams. Very few people had horses. They maybe had horses over at... at uh... Uh, I've read that they had horses over at Appleton. Grandma always talked about riding the horse or walking the trails here and there, or rowing to wherever she wanted to go. There was uh, never too much communication between the residents on the south and east end with the people on the north and west side. I think the first real road, other than uh, real road, uh, was when the first one they put in around, totally around the island. I remember uh, a couple of times when I walked around the island, and that was before they had improved West Mercer and East Mercer, uh, when they were just gravel roads. Dad talked her into buying an old Model T, and he learned how to work on it and drive it, and then the deal was that he was to teach her how to do it, which he did. and. Uh, so then, uh, once they had the roads, uh, then she could drive down to uh, Roanoke. Roanoke Ferry was a car ferry. I think the capacity would have been probably about a dozen cars. But see, the Anderson Steamboat Company owned all of the vessel transportation on the island, which was the only transportation until they put the East Channel Bridge in, which was the first time that cars could uh, come back and forth. Living on the island, you see, uh, and uh, having the Yesler Cable and the Steamer Dawn, 
there was really no incentive for my family to have a car. And the first car that they had was this old Model T sedan that they got for me to go back and forth to, to the university. People used to come over here in the summertime and take the dawn, you know, the different ferries back to Seattle to work. And then, of course, in the fall and winter, they'd live in Seattle permanently, but they had summer homes over here. So we took the little uh, steamer Dawn. It would come along the waterfront and pick us up to go to high school. Well, my wife was actually born on Mercer Island, and she, um, her dad used to be a, an engineer on the Dawn. Well, the Dawn was a wonderful little old boat. It looked like it had been uh, cut off as a part of, a, of another boat. It was not very long. There was this one fellow that lived north of us, and he was always late, and uh, he would run down the last minute. <laughs> <laughs> one day he ran down the last minute and made a leap, missed the boat, <laughs> landed <laughs> in the lake. And he was famous from then on. <laughs> and all the West Side people going into work and whatnot would go back and forth with the steamer Dawn, which stopped at intervals of uh, about uh, seven or eight different docks, and take that to Leshai Park. The boat came back at four o'clock, and school got out at three o'clock, I think. So we walked over to friends that lived at the top of the hill there and became very good friends with them. And then when it was time to catch the boat, we walked down through the Yesler uh, trestle and, and got on the boat and we're home. And then the fellows at the same time that were, the men all came home on the 5.30 or the 6.30 boat. So you always knew they were gonna either be home at six or they were gonna be home at seven. And also there were seats in the boiler room. Uh, which in the winter time, a whole bunch of the men would uh, sit in the boiler room and uh, they would have a, a d discussion for about half an hour that it would take to uh, ride in the dawn from Mercer Island to uh, Leshai. It had a place you could sit in the back if it was a nice day, and all of the ladies and the children sat in the middle section, and uh, the men all sat around the engine room and discuss the affairs of the day. And it was really, uh, I think, something that they all missed when the berries went in. And of course, the dawn eventually sank. Actually, it sunk a couple of times, but they got it up again. It sank twice at the dock, <laughs> just because it was getting old and tired. And eventually, it was purposely put to sleep at the south end of the island. They sank it. There were beautiful woods around our house, and we just had lots of fun games with cowboys and Indians. And oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was our specialty. We had teams, we had forts, we had, uh, you know, this was in the, in the mile radius. We cut uh, hazel branches and pretended they were horses, and that we had a wonderfully adjustable bus driver who used to come and uh, we would, but we would all ride our wooden horses to the bus stop. And he'd wait patiently while we tied them to a tree. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we used to really believe in the fairies and we would take little crumbs and leave them on a mossy 
and you know that moss that has a little red cap to it. One of the favorite swimming areas was the Ogden Dock. Of course, there was a big difference then. Uh, the waterfront was regarded as permissible to walk across. And we would spend hours oh, catching yes. pollywogs and taking them home. And we had, uh, one day we had a whole dishpan filled <laughs> with <laughs> frog eggs and little pollywogs. And, and uh, my mother came in and said, well, girls, um, <laughs> There's a big fat blue jay out there. He's enjoyed all of eating all of your eggs. And then on the other side, where Mercerdale, that was all the, the frog ponds that, and we used. We had South America and Africa. We <laughs> had everything named, and we'd spend whole days just taking a picnic lunch and playing around on these hills. There used to be all sorts of deer. We had a huge vegetable garden out of here when we had our basement and uh, we had a whole crop of beans that were all ready to eat and deer came in overnight and ate the whole crop. World War II in the early 40s, the government helped fund a, a big fence around the whole farm area to uh, uh, keep out the deer. He's coming home from high school on East Mercer Way, I ran into a deer and knocked it down and bent my father's grill to his Chevrolet out pretty good. <laughs> and then the deer got up and walked away, but my dad was not thrilled with this sort of thing. The Lucas Farm was the principal uh, milk delivery. And you always knew what season it was by the taste of the milk. <laughs> according to what the cows have been eating. And uh, the delightful man that delivered the milk had a horse and cart and came around. Uh, they had a French driver called Monsieur Lesseur that would uh, uh, drive his horse carriages uh, delivering milk uh, t on the island. And uh, he would sing these French songs as, <laughs> as he came. He was a fr very French. We had uh, Mr. Dunny, who was a blind real estate man. I remember John Dunny very well. As a matter of fact, uh, he called me up one day and he said, Ed, we have to make a, um, an appraisal. Said, so he said, uh, I'll hold the tape and you read it. And so you would go see Mr. Dunny and he'd, he'd bring out the big plat book. And he said, well, now see there, see where it says so-and-so, yeah? Well, then over next to that, there's a lot there. See, I've got that marked. Well, that's so-and-so. So you better look at that. And then over here, down here on the other page is so-and-so. So he had the whole book memorized so he could speak off that book and tell you <coughs> properties that were listed for sale. He uh, was um, blinded in a hunting accident. We had Mr. Wilhite down at the other end of the island. He used to blow stumps up. So if you had stumps, well, you call Mr. Wilhite, he'd put dynamite there and <laughs> blow your stump up. Pappas had a reputation of uh, having sort of come from the underground uh, over in, in Italy. Yeah, I don't even remember Mr. Fleury, but he was, uh, I don't know, he must have been German or something. And he wrote endless letters to the newspaper. Uh, every week he had one or two letters. And when you said, Mr. Fleury, how are you? He said, always well. <laughs> During the war, he would go around and check to be sure that no lights were shining from our house in case there was a, bl oh, for the blackouts we had there. A fellow named Harry Slater, and Harry was a, a real craftsman. You know, the difference between his uh, skills and my skills was like Babe Ruth as compared to a little leaguer. In this property, we had a, call, a man called Mr. Denholm. <clears throat> he was a Scotchman, and his uh, folks, I guess, were in the carriage business in Scotland. And he came over here, and he lived in a little one-room cottage up on the top of the lot here. And we bought him with the property, <laughs> sort of. And he paid uh, $5.25, I think, a month for the for the property up there. So I found a guy that had a Shetland pony, and he sold it to me for a dollar. <laughs> And then I decided that I'd give him a little sex education, so we got a mayor. And, and over um, a 10-year period, I think I mentioned, we had nine 
Foldsborn here. Oh, lots of island characters. <laughs> <laughs> you go look in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. To finish the story about Harry Slater and the boat, about um, 1948, I think it was, uh, in May, I had a Jeep that I bought, World War Surplus Jeep. Um, we towed Harry's boat out from the back of the craft guild on a cradle, and it was on skids. And it was like a big festival. You know, there were 20 people there. <laughs> that was a lot of people on, in those days. It took us about, oh, I'd say an hour, an hour and a half to get it down to the water at the foot of 30th. Well, when we, get, when we got that boat into the water and we pushed it off of the, uh, the cradle that it was in, the, the keel got stuck in the mud. And oh, everybody was, what are we going to do? And they're pushing and everybody's getting wet and you know, and so forth. And the good Lord came, uh, sent an army tug. We saw an army tug coming by, you know, the, the Corps of Engineers and everybody yelled and the men on the tug looked and they could see what the problem was. They backed in as far as they could, threw us a line, put it on Harry's boat, towed it off the mud right to his uh, dock. And Harry had his dream. He and Loretta uh, didn't have any children. When they died, they left their home on the waterfront to the city. The Fortuna Park picnics were the big, big thing. The Ferry Fortuna would, uh, each weekend, there would be some sort of a, uh, of a goings on there. And that was delightful for us kids growing up in the island because there was no fence on the upper side. And we used to figure we practically owned the place. So whenever they'd have a big goings on, we'd all just go over to it. And that kept on until finally they fenced it. I can remember as kids, uh, we knew how to get over the fence and, and into the, they had dance bands and, and um, music and fun things like that. That's where um, Covenant Shores is now. And that had a very nice um, area and they would bring over a lot of people in Seattle, particularly before the bridge was built. Among the other community efforts was building the Kiwaden Clubhouse. And the men on the island all pitched in. Dad went to work on it, he was a good carpenter. Everybody pitched in and built it. And there was that kind of community get-together. That was the start of the volunteer fire department. About, um, we'd go to fires with these pump cans full of water, and I think they carried five gallons. And you'd be surprised, you could put out a lot of fires. One day I came home from school and the neighbor's house was just a bunch of charred ruin. They had the fire beat down, almost beat down and put out, but not completely. And they had to unhook their hoses, run to the uh, waterfront at the foot of uh, 32nd uh, on, uh, in East Seattle, put a hard suction on the front of the, t of the uh, fire truck and suck 500 gallons of water into the tank and then go back to the fire. Oh, by the time they did all of that, the house was gone. And, uh, Seattle was expanding. Rather than having each denomination have a church in each area, they kind of assigned, and they said, Mercer Island, you'd be the Episcopal Church, and someplace else would be this. So there, it was really kind of an ecumenical uh, church for many, many, many years, but it was the church on the island, really, uh, for a long time. At Christmas, Lutherans, Congregationalists, I don't care what they were, everybody went to the Episcopal Church for Christmas because it was the only church on Mercer Island. And somebody came up with the idea of they'd like to have a building where they could have tools and everybody would chip in to buy the tools. You see what I'm driving at. And so then they could, they'd have a place to work where they didn't have it in their homes. And they uh, asked to have the used lumber from the floating bridge. And that's basically what the craft guild is built of, is mostly of that lumber that they got free. And they opened the craft guild sometime in um, 1940. 
until they put the floating bridge in, the only cars would come on the East Channel Bridge and uh, on a ferry. The Times was bitterly opposed to the, to the floating bridge, and they fought it openly, right down to the last. Colonel Blatham, who then was the, I think he had been the founder of the Times, and he looked upon himself as the ultimate city father, and he wrote editorials against it all the time. He just wasn't going to have it. And then the day that it opened, he wrote an editorial admitting defeat, and the last line on it was, P.S., the darn thing floats. Well, it worked a hardship on the girls because in order to take a date out, it would cost you 25 cents to go over and pick her up, and then 25 cents to get back to town, and then 25 cents to take her home, and 25 cents to get back. So it was pretty wild. There was one girl on Mercer Island whose father used to give the boys a dollar if they, <laughs> when they took his, his uh, daughter out. So <laughs> it was one way to beat the rap. Then uh, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, and uh, so you couldn't build anything. Don was active in construction and was building uh, defense. Uh, you know, I can remember having to have blackout curtains uh, and because uh, uh, they were afraid bomb Boeing was going to get bombed. In 1942, the um, Army had a anti-aircraft group that was up not where the lakes is now, and they had seven or eight machine guns set up on towers, and they had a couple of larger guns there, and um, I was, uh, there were about 125 soldiers there, and uh, it was uh, really exciting for me, because here I was a 10-year-old kid, and I would deliver papers up there, and uh, the, uh, the mess sergeant was always nice. He would fix me pie, and the, the guys would always play with me. I mean, it, and they had nothing else to do. I was just sheer boredom at that point, because the chance of the Japanese attacking, it was for the Boeing at Renton Field that they were worried about, uh, was getting more and more remote as time went on. And I think they left in about two years, here from 42 to 44. President Roosevelt's daughter lived on the island. She was working for the uh, PI, I guess it was, the newspaper. Anyway, their little Johnny was in nursery school, and so the Secret Service men brought him to school every day, and then they stayed while he was there. So if a toy got broken, or, or they were always there to help, it was really kind of fun. I was riding one of my kids' horses down there, and I was galloping around the dumb thing, and all of a sudden I looked up, and we were airborne. And we, and we the horse lit on the backside of this big hole, and I slid off his nose and slid out about 20 feet in the grass and didn't get hurt a bit. But we just didn't see it. It was still there. And uh, the dumb horse was charging around, and I was racing him around in a circle. <laughs> we found the old pit where the, uh, the uh, anti-aircraft gun had been. Of course, we had roads around the island. Some were paved, others were gravel. And we had one going over the top of the island. This is 1940. This happened by 1945. And part of the impetus of that, I'm sure, is because there was a big uh, anti-aircraft establishment down the south end of the island. The main road going down the island, Island Crest Way, stopped about 42nd Street. You, you came up to 40th at the signal, and you turned up by the Lutheran Church, you went down by the schools, you went over two blocks, and you came down and bent around, and then finally, just about where the school is now, on Lily Island, that was straight down to here. Almost nobody lived on it. You had the feeling if your car broke down, you were going to have to walk home because you couldn't find anybody up there. Uh, and it was, it was a very rural environment. We saw the ad in the newspaper for this 150 feet of waterfront. This was in 1941. We Doctor and architect and had the plans for our whole house and uh, decided uh, in uh, 1944 that we would go ahead and build the basement. And so we moved over here by tug and barge. Uh, we still have the bill for the and uh, $35 for tug and barge overnight. But we loaded all our possessions on the barge and, and hauled it around here and carried it up to our basement. People didn't have a lot of money. And what 
uh, well, there were at least two places up on First Hill where they dug a um, hole and put the basement in, and then they put a roof over the basement. And they lived in the basement until they got enough money to start framing in up above. And there was uh, two by four studying. I mean, you could see from one uh, end of the basement to the other. We had wonderful Halloween parties here. By this time, we had three children. We moved a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and a three-month-old. We moved in October. We were waiting for me to get out of the service to get married. But the war started 36 days before I was to be discharged. So anyway, uh, I came home on survivor's leave. We got married and back out to sea I went. And the first thing I got was a letter from her saying I want to buy Aunt Molly's house in East Seattle. And I said to myself, I don't know who Aunt Molly is, but East Seattle, is that up on the hills in back of downtown Seattle? $2,750 is what the house cost. I know a lot of people can't believe that, but that's the truth. My dad uh, traded a piece of property in Seattle that we were living on then and built a house in 1941. And that's when we moved to Mercer Island, built a little house here. And the cost was for the whole house was $4,000. That was in 1941 in it. Um, was a whale of a lot of money then, but he was, he was working. They sold lots in there that were 60 by 100 for $250. And GIs were coming over uh, buying lots. When we moved upstairs, it was five years later, we had two more children. My mother, God bless her, had bought this piece of, this is an acre, had bought this piece of property many, many years ago. There was a little house on it that she rented. And when we were married, she gave us this acre as a wedding present. Now, can you think of a nicer wedding gift than that? The building boom didn't seem to hit Mercer Island nearly as quick as it hit everything from Bellevue East. And that was good. We didn't, we didn't need that many more people moving on the island. After the bridge, the development, of course, took place with the easy lots. In other words, the level stuff and, you know, things that they could build easily and quickly. We were living in a dumb little apartment, uh, and I'd just been married up on Capitol Hill. And I hated that, so when she told me about this piece, uh, and a Seattle policeman owned it, and he uh, put a price on it that was so fantastic that I, could, you know, I couldn't believe he wanted to sell it for that. And I, I think something like $4,000, this whole two acres. We um, got here before there was a sewer line, so I went to the sewer district, which was a separate district at that time, and asked, what do I do? I mean, you're, not, you're going to be here in several months, but what do I do in the meanwhile? He say, said, well, why don't you dig a cesspool and say nothing about it? Just, I've never figured out, in other words, they were giving me an answer of how we could find, be sitting 200 feet above the lake level, and we could, at 45 feet, we found all the water we could use. Uh, then, of course, as it went on, lots got tougher because they were steeper and ravines and, you know, cost a lot of money to to build in there. When this, this site was level for the construction by a bulldozer. I made sure I was here, so not a spoonful of dirt got pushed over down the hill. All got pulled back away to build a platform where this house is. Our neighbor wasn't so lucky. Later, when their building platform was bulldozed, it was just shoved over the edge. It took them years and years and years to get that vegetation back, because that was just sterile soil. Next year we will have been here 60 years and it was wooded. Uh, I, I look out here and see all my babies, all the things I planted from seed and from cuttings and, and uh, that are all these huge tall trees now and uh, it's, I feel really blessed to still be here. 
the Roanoke Inn, which uh, developed into the Mercer Island Club, was uh, in reality the political situation on Mercer Island. I happened to be president of it at that time. The reason that the town of Mercer Island was first incorporated was because there was a developer that thought it was, uh, since it would be a municipality, he could get a liquor license. 57, 58, 59, or when I was in the service, the lake was so contaminated, my dad was saying how the metro was going to clean this up, but it would take 15 or 20 years. I said, I can't believe it's gonna take that long. The chief member of the school board was a friend of mine that he used to see on the steamer Dawn, and he was moving back to Seattle, and he asked me if I would be willing to take his place on the school board, uh, which uh, I did while I was on the board. Uh, all of the current schools on Mercer Island were built. I helped build that um, Lake Ridge School, but the the downside of that, that was the first school. They tore that school down and rebuilt another school there two years ago. So um, I guess I didn't do a very good job. <laughs> I told Cleve and Shell I thought I was going to run for that charter commission. He said, why, do you, why don't do that? Run for the city council. Oh. <laughs> so I did some doorbelling, and I picked the precincts based upon First, I didn't do the hillsides, the waterfronts. Too steep, too many houses per driveway. Or stayed on top where you get more houses per, per hour than you can down below. Apparently, people respond to the chemistry more than anything else. Interesting. So I got elected, somewhat to my surprise. I was in a um, project in Venezuela uh, in the Orinoco River, and I was saying something to the scientists from Venezuela about, uh, I, I lived on a lake at Lake Washington, and he said, oh, Lake Washington. He said, that's one of the great stories of limnology, the study of inland lakes and rivers. Uh, one of the great success stories, and he had heard of Lake Washington, knew it, down in Venezuela. The reason that I happened to get into politics was because they moved the 41st district from Bellingham down here. And they had an incumbent senator holdover, but uh, no members of the legislature. And so I decided that I was knowledgeable about the whole thing down there, and I decided to run. When I went to the Senate, I was uh, promoted to majority floor leader, uh, which uh, I enjoyed that very well, but I had always gotten along quite well with the Democratic leadership because uh, while my family traditionally all the way through and my, my grandfather was Republican governor of Iowa, had been Republicans, yet I was well aware of the fact that there were very able people on the Democrat side. When I became mayor, I was mayor of the of the city of Mercer Island and the town of Mercer Island was separate, two separate organizations. That had been incorporated separately by someone who wanted to get their liquor permit, thought he could get it easier with something more controllable than so he might be. Well, that's, it's, they just started letting a city have sales tax. Well, we would have no sales tax because all our businesses were, were in another jurisdiction. So we wanted to merge them. We had a person assigned to every voter we knew was going to vote for us in the town to make sure they voted. And they were to let us know by four o'clock, had they voted yet? One-on-one <laughs> -on -one master ma managing that, that situation. There were some people involved in the town government who didn't want to, it to go away, so they opposed it. And the night before, there were two or three efforts with people handing out scurrilous documents around. And we saw that and went around and picked them up. You know, it was a really local government hands-on political battle. Uh, and we won. 
uh, the 990 issue came up. During that time, I went to a hearing. A lawyer named John Ehrlichman was speaking for some landowners on the island, complaining about a plan the state had at that point. And they were going to hold a hearing, which they held in the Seattle Center. And I spoke for the island, saying we needed this, but we didn't want to see it or hear it or smell it. George Andrews, who was then director of highways, said, if you will agree to support the project, we'll jointly design it with you. And I said, well, that probably makes sense, George. Let's try that. But you have that project coming across the East Channel Bridge, something like 12 or 14 lanes, and neither you nor I will have credibility if that lands on the island. Because we can't talk to them about redesigning it when you already have established a footprint. He said, OK, I'll stop it. He canceled the contract. They had just barely gotten things out of the water. And they stood there for a decade after that, paid off the contractor, paid the profit, shut it down as a evidence of commitment to a new process. Result was, when we got done, we had a design which the island really supported. And we were lucky. John Ehrlichman, who had been the attorney here, was on Nixon's staff. We managed to muscle through the approval from, from, the, from the highway folks who thought that was pretty damn expensive for that little section. But um, we had muscle in the right place at the right time. And uh, that was just before those guys got caught up in Watergate and uh, both went to jail for a while. But uh, uh, strange politics. It was a real adventure. There were no other people. I can remember our bedroom was downstairs, and I can remember turning out my light one night and looking out and saw somebody across the lake turn their light out, and they were our neighbors. Mercer Island in those days, uh, I would say, was heaven. Historically, we sometimes have been a bridge between east side and west side, which we are. We are a bridge between east side and west side. Uh, moderate some of the anti-Seattle rhetoric from the east side and vice versa. You know, if you take a map and from the uh, northeast corner of King County to the southwest corner of King County and vice versa, draw another line like that, you'll find that Mercer Island is in the middle of the, those two lines converging. The school system, we looked into that before we bought, and it was spoken very highly of. And with our five kids going through the whole system, uh, we agree. I really think that it was the idea of good schools that people came to Mercer Island. The first, the most important reason, and the second reason is because of its convenience. To live in this kind of a, kind of a suburban community that actually has a feeling of um, remoteness to it is really quite remarkable. It was ours, and it was our property, and we were so thrilled to be here we could hardly stand it. It's just been a pleasure live, living here on the island. I wouldn't want to move. I'm going to die here. Not soon, but, but someday. <laughs> when you, you look back on it, it certainly was a privilege. But then it's been a privilege to live here for 54 years on this, on this spot. It's been a wonderful place to live. It's still a wonderful place to live. And so Mercer Island has become a pleasant, prosperous suburb, a comfortable place, famous for good schools and expensive real estate, home to movers and shakers. It grows and changes, even as it hurtles down a road with many surprising turns into a future barely glimpsed. Not so long ago, there were tents on the beach and a steamer called the Dawn.